Good morning, everyone. This morning's Bible readings come from, firstly, from Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 9. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. And the second reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 20. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was re reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Good morning, dear family. I hope you're doing well and keeping warm on this rather chilly morning. You're probably warmer than we are here. This is our last week of Jesus the Game Changer. And I don't know about you, but I've, I've really enjoyed and I've had my eyes opened by a lot of things in the last few weeks. Today we come to the last one and it's quite fitting really that it, it's kind of all brought together and we're looking at global mission and particularly in the last hundred years, what has happened and what is happening now. So the episode begins like this. It talks about the World Missionary Conference that was held in Edinburgh in 1910. So that's, you know, more than 100 years ago. Now, this was a group of largely white Western Protestant men, and they were planning for mission in the new century. And this was a group of people dedicated to spreading the gospel. And I guess like you or I would, they kind of assumed that what was working then and what had worked in the last century would continue to work and would continue to go from strength to strength in the 20th century. That kind of this Western model of mission would continue into the future. Little did they know. In, instead, it was a century of remarkable change that no one could have predicted. They were just four, four years before the outbreak of the First Great World War. There's another war, there's all sorts of wars, there's social revolution, there's technology that just changes the landscape of how we communicate. And we become, we do become more of a global village. Um, people travel so easily around the globe in a way that they couldn't have imagined in 1910. All of these things happened. And then also in this time, we have the Western church kind of shrinking and struggling with all these changes and struggling to connect with the people around them. And then we have 
the rest of the church, church in different places, growing like wildfire, China, South America, West Africa. And these, these kind of nations are, are grouped together in, in this episode and referred to as the Global South, which I'm going to do too, so I don't have to keep mentioning all the different ones. The Global South not only turns to Jesus, but they are sending out missionaries to places like the UK and the US, Europe, even Australia. Un, unable to predict this 100 years ago. Now, I was really deeply encouraged and inspired as I watched this episode, and I hope you will be too. But do you know what I realised? I realised that my own mental picture of mission needs a bit of an update. I was aware of the church growth in the global south, but I hadn't really adjusted my mindset. And I guess it's partly because the people I know are still Western people going to unwestern parts of the world. Same for you, probably. So it'll depend on your experience, but I wonder if you feel a bit the same and whether you need an update as well. You know, I find it really hard not to be affected by our culture's view of mission and evangelism. Here in our Australian version of Western culture, I believe we have a deeply embedded, widely assumed, often unspoken social rule. And it goes like this. Religious belief is strictly private and should not be imposed on anyone. And this is adhered to by the media, defended by all forms of media, by government, by public policy, by just life and culture generally. Religions with no interest in converting other people, in sharing their beliefs, are quite happily accepted. But Christianity seems to have this tiresome need to get everybody else to believe in their God. And the general attitude towards that is scepticism, sometimes hostility, but even these days I find moral superiority. Because in the name of diversity, um, everything seems to gain a greater moral value. Here's an example from the conversation, which is a fairly, I think, a fairly balanced uh, online newspaper, not one to be incendiary, but this is what it says. Converting others to Christianity raises a fundamental question about whether religious diversity is a reality to be celebrated or an obstacle to be overcome. See how it's been framed in terms of diversity. And I think, I think the answer here is kind of assumed that we're going to say, really, it's a, it's a reality to be celebrated, but those Christians, they think it's an obstacle to be overcome. So here's the thing. To obey Jesus' call to be witnesses, to make disciples, we actually have to intentionally set out to break this social rule that we have absorbed like everybody else. And I'm coming to feel that it's a fundamental cause of our reluctance to share Jesus, particularly if, as I am, you are prudent and sensitive and you've been taught not to impose on other people. It's hard to make that decision, to break that rule. And yet the rule itself has an even more up under outdated picture of mission than we Christians have. It's that picture of the Christian missionary who's a big brother, who brings their colonial trappings with them, who exploits the resources of the countries they go to, who makes the most of their different balance of power, and yes, force, forces people to give up their religion for the Christian God. If this was ever true, it's certainly not true now. And this episode of Jesus the Game Changer says, look, while 19th century colonialism may be seen as the scourge of mission, that picture is woefully out of date and it's now thankfully completely wrong. Dana Roberts says, the growth of Christianity in the global south is not from colonialism, but from the freedom that cultures gained after colonialism died. The, the people who had understood and come to know Jesus wanted to be able to do that in their own way and they were set free to do that when colonialism faded away. The growth that they've seen has come after that. 
And it's not just that Western missionaries are more sensitive, it's that missionaries are no longer largely Western. The places that Christianity flourished is send, sending people out. So yes, it's not the West to the rest, and hasn't been for a long time, it's everyone to everywhere. Just think of Owen's example from last, year, last week uh, in Nagaland, where not only has the peop- have the people become strong believers, but they're beginning to send out their own people. There's many more great stories like this in this episode. Tefera Endalu from Ethiopia says his denomination is sending out missionaries to India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Chad. He says now is the time for the global south to send out missionaries. And you can see the enthusiasm in his face. Ni Amu Daku from African Enterprise says, actually, since Western political tensions have been raised uh, due to 9-11, there's actually a lot of African missionaries who can go places where Western missionaries are not welcome. And they've actually gone with great success. Ermios Mamo from Addis Ababa actually explains how a new Christian shared Jesus with him. And because she stepped out and shared what little she knew about Christ, he says, I am here standing and speaking about the grace and gift of God. This global church is alive and kicking. And here's the thing. I think this change shows us that the drive to share Jesus is not what our culture tells us it is. It's not just an inheritance from colonial ancestors that's not appropriate for today's world where diversity and tolerance is king. It's not. It's the DNA of Christianity. It's fundamental to who we are. So these other cultures have read the Bible, have come to know Jesus, are following him and have naturally concluded that the next step is to, be, uh, to being a faithful follower is to sharing that good news. Vinoth Ramachandra says in his book, missionary outreach was not an activity tagged on later to a faith that was basically about something else, but it flowed even from the beginning, from the very logic of the death and resurrection of Christ. It's in the DNA. Let's go and read again that passage in 2 Corinthians 5. For Christ's love compels us Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So now we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled, to God. Two things I'd like you to notice about this passage. The first one is this, Christ died for all. God is reconciling himself to the world. This is not a private individual faith that we are part of. The good news is about the world and for the world. Ramachandra says again, the earliest Christian profession, Jesus is Lord, was never meant to be a statement of personal devotion. It was meant to be a claim to universal validity. Jesus is Lord of everyone. The second thing I'd like you to notice is that Christians are the means of God's reaching the world because Christ's love compels us. That's Christ's love both for us. He loved us and so we love others. And also Christ's love for those others and because we belong to him, We love them too, and we want them to know him. Now, these truths, I know they're nothing new to most of us. Many of us have known these things for years. And the last thing I want this morning 
is for us all to feel guilty for a while about not being missionaries in Africa and then go back to what we normally do. For a start, guilt is a terrible motivator. And look at this passage. Christ's love is meant to compel us. Not guilt, not we should, but because he has loved us, we love others. So how can we respond in a way that's perhaps fits our lives, is realistic to where we are and what we do. Well, I was a bit stuck on this this week and I was chatting to Sarah in the corridor, socially distanced, of course, and she had some really practical and helpful and down-to-earth things to suggest. And so rather than try and put her words into my words, I've actually invited her to come this morning and say them to you. Thanks, Sarah. Welcome. It's the first time, no, second time in the uh, live stream environment. Yep, that's right. So first time, or well, second time to be in the church. Yes, and very strange to <laughs> A little look bit at empty. Empty seats, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, Sarah, most of us know your story, how you were a missionary kid, how you and Owen spent years in Japan, and we might be tempted to believe that perhaps you're some different special kind of species of Christian um, that can do that kind of thing, whereas we can't. Um, perhaps you could correct us by letting us know a bit of your story about how you and Owen uh, were led to go to Japan in the first place. Uh, yeah, sure. I think um, one of the things that it has been hard um, sometimes when people have said, oh, you know, you're a missionary, you've gone to Japan, you've taken your family there, I, I could never do that. And it, it, it sounds strange to me because it, it wasn't some um, immediate, okay, now we're in Australia, then were in Japan. It, it wasn't an instantaneous thing that happened and even the build-up was a long process. And I guess I'd call it a bit of a step-by-step -step process. Owen used to describe it to people as um, it's always easier to steer a moving vehicle. So I think, I guess the, the start of our journey was more about um, having a sense of, of God's love and, and that, that sense of being compelled to share God's love as um, you've mentioned in that Bible verse. And we had both had exposure to mission through different experiences, from short-term mission to some of my experience as a child. So I think there was always an underlying sense of, of being interested and challenged by mission. But at the same time, we finished uni, we got married, we had jobs in Australia, we bought a house, you know, the things that sound very settling. But at the same time, I think we were still open to some steps of, of where we might go, is what's going to be the end result. And I think um, as I think about it now, it's almost like how we use Google Maps, that when you hit start on the direction, you only get the next direction. You don't get to see the whole map. And I feel like that was um, a lot of our journey, was just step by step allowing God to keep challenging us and move us a little, give us a few nudges um, in the direction. So for the first two and a half years of marriage, we didn't really do a lot. We just worked and had our life. And then we had Rachel and then it was almost like, oh, we've got a newborn. And then it was like, wait, this could be the ultimate excuse to never do anything. <laughs> um, so I think at that point uh, we decided, well, the first thing we can do is perhaps get training to do something in ministry. We don't even know what, but that's the first step. So we just took that first step, starting some Bible, I want to start a Bible college and then, yeah, just I think every little step and every little direction just kept coming ahead of us. Um, many of you know I'm a Japanese teacher. That was what I was interested in. So there was a natural interest in Japan and it just kept heading in that direction. It found out about mission organisations and just kept moving. And there's lots of big things that had to happen to move a family overseas and those things as well. But it was a, definitely a step-by-step -step process and it actually took about eight years <laughs> from the beginning to the end. Um, to get there so yeah it, 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 it was really about that underlying sense of we just had this desire to to consider how we would share God's love and and God just kept moving us in each little direction but those small steps are ones that anyone could make really They're that's not, right yeah. yeah none of them were, were massive none of them were impossible they were just small steps each one mm. yeah so you're now back in Australia have been for a few years so you're not a missionary anymore um not doing anything like that? Oh, no, wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's funny. There's something that, that I think is a, um, a part of, of us as people that we have um, 
been given this gift of the good news of the gospel. And there is a sense that we, we want to share that we have a desire to, to, to give that gift to others. And that never changes. It was very difficult to come back because I had sensed that desire to share the gospel with the Japanese. So it was quite hard for me to then step back and, and say, well, where are the Japanese <laughs> in Adelaide? And I, I actually did try to find some people. I even rang up a, a play group that said it was a Japanese play group and they said, no, thank you. We don't want any foreigners in our group. It's just for <laughs> Japanese mums. And I was like, okay. So I kept trying to find, is there a way I can reach out to Japanese? And what I, I found in the end was that I actually had other opportunities brought almost in front of me, to speak to other people from other countries that I never thought I would have had a chance to befriend. And so that was very unusual. Um, one actually was through Alan, introducing me to a lady from Iraq. And um, yeah, that's been just a really wonderful opportunity to get to know her and um, her family. And yeah, she's uh, a person that's very open to, to just talking about, you know, herself and her life. And she had to be the one to be humble and and practice English to speak to me. So it was quite humbling for me not to be able to use her language. So, yeah, I, and another one was a lady I met in the park is from India. And I wasn't, I wasn't looking around going, who can I speak to? I had just noticed this lady with her son a few times, actually, when I'd walk the dog. And I, one day I thought, oh, I've seen her a few times. Maybe I'll just say hi. And her little boy came and wanted to play with the dog and so I just said oh hi I haven't seen you here before and Evie moved and she said oh yes I've moved recently and so we just struck up a little conversation and she said she didn't know anyone in the area it's just her and her son I said oh gee this must must be a bit lonely for you to just come here and not know anyone and she just burst into tears and I thought oh no what have I done <laughs> um so I think God just opened a little door there that I I just went to walk my dog I didn't expect any anything to happen that day but I've had a chance to build a friendship with somebody and and those are the things that are unexpected but I think there's a sense that just a little bit of a an openness to to maybe just you know strike up a conversation or or something like that yeah yeah so what would you suggest to those of us who are who would like to take some steps just some small ones um, into sharing Jesus with others or even just to start relationships with people we don't know or from other cultures? Um, yeah, I think a lot of it is about um, not feeling like the, the step you have to take is massive. It's, you know, um, or I have to be like that person or I see this person over here doing all these amazing things, I could never be that person. I think God's given us our, our own gifts and, and abilities and experiences. So... Even with my friend from Iraq, even though I couldn't speak her language, I knew what it was like to be the new person in another country. So I kind of had to channel the, that feeling of how did I feel when it was hard for me to live in another country and I could channel that. So I think God gives us experiences that give us an empathy and, and understanding and they're unique to us. So I think just um, it's really important to just realise that God gives us a, a unique position where we live where we, the people we interact with, could you be walking down the street with your dog, you just don't know. I think it's um, really important to just have that sense that God's love does compel us and to be open and ready for what the challenge might come to us that particular day. And that's probably been my, the hardest thing for me is, to, is to, to be obedient to that nudge of the Holy Spirit. Because as I said, a few times I saw this lady at the park and I have to admit I didn't speak to her the first time. It took me a few goes. But I, I, I increasingly felt this sense. It was really important maybe for me to... I just kind of felt a nudge. There was something compelling me to actually speak to her. So I think it's following those nudges from the Holy Spirit. It's being in this situation that you are in, having empathy and compassion for the people around you. And I really do feel God brings them across our path. And, and, and the nudge and the challenge is to be willing to be open and start a relationship, a, a friendship or a connection with somebody because that's what earns us the right to speak about deeper things is if we build that friendship. So we can't get from zero to 100 and suddenly share our faith with a stranger. That's less likely to happen, but we can build a friendship and um, those opportunities actually do come across our path and often when we're not expecting it. So being open, just feel that nudge of the Holy Spirit and just, yeah, mm. take up the challenge. And we talked about how, like, nothing is wasted. God oh, doesn't yeah. waste anything we do, even if we're not the ones who see 
who see the results. Yeah, that's right. So one thing I, I think I felt in Japan is sometimes, you know, I make friendships and I can get to know people, but, um, you know, how, how can I sort of keep pushing? How can I, you know, convert this person or how can we get to this this point of them understanding about God? And, and, it, and, and it could be a little frustrating at times to not know how to get there or, or what's happening, but it's really important to keep praying and knowing that somehow we're part of a process mm. and we, we don't know again, which direction the next side of the, the map is going to take us. But um, at first, it was very important to me and has been for a long time, is that um, it says in Isaiah 55, 11, that God's word never goes out empty. So even just a small thing, um, one example, this friend from Iraq, um, her baby was not sleeping well and I had visited her with Joshua and Joshua one, that night said, I think we should be praying for her baby to sleep tonight, Mum. <laughs> and I told her <clears throat> the next time I saw her, well, we've really been praying that your baby would sleep better. And she said, oh, that is so wonderful that you prayed for me. And she was so happy to have someone pray for her. And it wasn't objectionable or offensive or anything. She was just happy. And that's always been my experience. Nobody ever gets upset when you, <laughs> when you offer to pray for them. And it's just little things like that. This is the way God's word never goes out empty. You know, he, he, he's planting a seed. and and there, there's there's opportunity for that to be to be watered and and flourished. So yeah, take take heart. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. You you got a wonderful way of putting things, and um, it's lovely to hear about your experience. And you can tell, can't you, that Sarah would be happy to talk to you about this at any time because it's something she loves to talk about. Yeah, so. I talk about it too much. <laughs> no, no, never. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> it's been wonderful to have our eyes open through this series, hasn't it? to see the Holy Spirit alive and working in the world, to see God's word becoming available in everybody's own language to the hungry, to see faith in Jesus not just being Western anymore, if it ever was, to see new, new followers compelled to tell the good news, even in the face of risk and opposition, and to take, even to take God's truth to where it's been known and forgotten. And this is talked about a little in, in this week's episode. So I hope that you will take up the opportunity, and you have been, um, in small groups to discuss what you've been watching, um, to take it a bit further and take some action if you can. Watch this episode this week. It's really worthwhile. Pay attention to that nudge of the spirit that Sarah was talking about. Uh, you, might, you might have a neighbour. You might have, like Sarah said, someone you kind of know you should have spoken to. Well, God is gracious and pray that he will bring that person past you again tell someone else about how you'd like to change or what you'd like to reach out and step out and do whether that's your small group or a pastor or a friend or even just your spouse or your parent so they can support you and ask you about it and let's think about what we can do as a church too how can we more actively support and participate in global mission only park has a long history of that i've found out a long history of global mission partnership. But we need some new strength. We need some new leadership and maybe a new approach. And maybe God is prompting you to be part of that. Is the Spirit nudging you? As we, as we finish, uh, two words that come to my mind. Are you open? Oh, open and nudge. Are you open to God's nudges? I really like that image that Sarah gave us that we don't, like a Google map. We don't need to know the full journey. We just need to know the next step and take it. And that's what we hope for you is you're open and you take that next step.